So in higher level languages, we use functions a lot. Here's an example in Python, C Sharp, and even C in this case could be considered a high level language. So the question is, how do we do this in assembly in machine code on the CPU level? Because when we think about it, all instructions in any program are just a series of bytes in memory. There's no boundaries or structure to it. So we need to do that ourselves. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in this video. We're gonna write some real functions in assembly and show exactly what's happening under the hood on the machine level. If you wanna follow along with me, go to x64.halb.it, click on launch the app, and then make sure that GNU is selected here. I have a hello world program in the description of the video. If you wanna copy and paste it, you'll see that it just prints hello world here. But the problem with this program is it assumes that we're gonna read it in a very linear fashion, just going straight down forever. And that's not a very good way of having a program. We really wanna have this part of the program, which is the actual printing of hello world to be its own function. And then we want the exit segment where we tell the operating system to kill our program to be a separate function, perhaps exit. So this could be called print and this could be called exit. So now we have somewhat of an outline of our functions. You can see that exit just marks this instruction with an address that we can reference using the exit label. It doesn't do anything like turn it into a function or a method or anything high level. It just lets us access this address 401020 easily without having to write this every time. And if we change our code and the address changes, then the label will automatically update. Uh, so now that we have our two areas with the memory addresses, so we know where this instruction starts and we know where this instruction starts, you can see that even though we have these labels, it's just going to go right through them. Again, the instruction pointer and the CPU just goes straight down. It doesn't matter what's in the way. The only way for us to modify the order of execution is to modify the instruction pointer. So the way that we do that is with an instruction called jump. What we should do first is rearrange our program and let's put exit first, right? This way we're forced to jump to print because if we just run the program, it will just exit and, and stop here. And it stops because it tells the operating system that we've quit. Right now, our program no longer really works. We wanna print, but we're stuck with this exit code in front of us. So we need to jump over this code to print, hence the name of the instruction. So at the very beginning, all we need to do is write JMP for jump and then put print. And if we compile this, then you'll see now this is the instruction that's about to be executed. This is the one that we just wrote. If we click step, we've jumped over exit and we've jumped directly to print 40100E. And now we can actually print hello world again, but now we're gonna get an error message. Since we jumped over exit and we got to print, and then after we finished our system calls, it went down into this empty memory region and created this segmentation fault where the operating system shut us down somewhat violently because we violated its rules. So ideally what we would do here in this example is we would jump to print and execute that, and then we would jump back to exit to to exit the program cleanly so we could put jump exit right here so we're going to launch the program jump to print print hello world and then jump up to exit so we start off we jump down to print we finish printing with our system call and then now we're going to jump back up to exit to exit our program now we have an exit with code zero which is exactly what we want you can see that with this simple instruction jump, we're able to control where the CPU is pulling instructions from and how it's executing. This is the main way ultimately of how any sort of function call happens. It jumps the instruction pointer to that new line of where you wanna execute code. Now, this is a pretty rigid program here. You know, normally a function when you call it it's going to return to where you were. So for example, it's not really up to the print function to decide to exit the program. Now, if you're writing code like this by hand, you can do whatever you want. But let's say that we wanted a more traditional experience. Let's say that we wanted to print and then we want to exit, right? Let's consider this our main function, sort of the driver of our program. And these are just utility functions, good practice. They only do one thing, they do it well, and then they give control back to our, let's say our main function here. So if we put the exit here, we wanna call print, and then we wanna call exit. If we run this, then we'll see that we have a bit of an issue because we're gonna go to print and we have the same problem as before. We run into this empty memory space because after the system call, there is nothing here to stop execution. It just continues to go down. So what we need is a way to allow print to return us back to where we were. So when we finish calling print, really ideally what we want is to go to this line of code. So we're on line six, print executes, and then we end up on line seven. 
Now, this is where the stack comes in. And there's two instructions. One of them is called call and the other is called return. And we're going to look at that. But what I want us to do first is manually build this construct ourselves, so that we can see why the stack is so valuable. So really, what we need to do is decide where can we store our return address. And what we can do is we can actually give it a label so that we have an easy access to this line of code. Let's call it return. Now, what we want is an agreement with our function here. Let's choose one register to store our return address. And then what we can do is we can use that return address in print and jump to that return address. And that way it will be dynamic. We can call print from anywhere and it will always listen to the return address that we populated. So let's use register 15. So before we call print, we need to load register 15 with the return address. So in this case, it's just going to be return, this return tag right here. So let's double check that this works. Return is 100A, and we can see register 15, we loaded it in the previous instruction, and it is 100A. So now in print, let's jump to register 15, which is going to be that return address. And this way, it's sort of a complete function where we can call it because we know its memory address, and then it always returns to whatever we place in register 15. So let's test this out. We load our return address first, so that's 100A, then we jump down to print we end up printing hello world. And then now that print is done, we're going to jump back to our saved return address. So we click that. And now we're back up to return. And now we can jump to the exit, which in this case, we don't really need to jump. It's the very next line of code anyway. But you can see that we called print. And then when print was done, instead of going off into nowhere land and, and dying by the operating system, we actually jumped back to the very next line of code, which is jump to exit. So if we continue, you see now we're in the exit function and we can exit cleanly. So we have the original implementation, even though our code is out of order here, we have an exit before print, but using jump and using the control flow that we have over the CPU, we can have it print out hello world, just like the way that we had it before. So there's one main limitation here. And that is, imagine if print needed to call another function, you can imagine that if you have a program, and you call one function, that function may call another function, which calls another function and calls another one. So really, we only have enough space here to store one address in register 15. And even if we decided to use all of our registers for addresses, which wouldn't make any sense, because we wouldn't be able to do any arithmetic or process any data. But even if we did do that, then we'd be limited still to only 16 return addresses. And as you know, in something like recursion, you might have dozens, hundreds, or potentially thousands of function calls. So it doesn't quite cut it. And let's simulate that to make this crystal clear. Let's say that our first string was just hello. And then let's say that we had another string called world. So we also need to get the length of our second string. So s2 len, let's call it. And we went over this in a previous video, if you haven't seen it, but don't worry too much. If you haven't, we can still proceed here with understanding how these functions work. So in this case, let's rename print to print hello. And then we need to update our call to print hello, and then copy print hello, and rename print hello to print world. So we need to update the string that we're printing, right? Print hello is going to print string one, which is hello. And print world is going to print string two, which is the string for world. And let's get rid of our jumps and make sure that this works. So here's a mini challenge right here. We know that we want to jump to print hello, but print hello only prints hello. So we need print hello to call print world. And then we need print world to call exit. So we're just going to put jump print world. And then at the end of print world, we're going to jump to exit. And this should have the same result that we had before. Although I have an error message here. Let's see what I did wrong. I added a colon by accident here. All right, so let's start the program. We want to jump to print hello first, print that out, then jump to print world, print that out, and then jump all the way back up to exit and exit the program. So this works well, we can run it a couple times, nothing is going wrong. That's great. Uh, so this is again in a very static form. So let's make it dynamic. We know in the beginning that ultimately, we want to load into our register, right, our return address for return, which is this line of code here. So print hello is going to jump back to r15, like what we had before. But we have a bit of an issue because when print hello calls print world, print hello needs to tell print world 
where it was executing. Again, you know, it needs to be dynamic. So we're going to remove this exit here because that's static. We want it to be dynamic. In our case, we're using R15. So print hello, and you probably see the problem coming up right now. If we load to R15, and let's say that we had down here a tag called return hello, right? So this is just a return address for our hello function that we want print world to return to. So load R15, return hello, then print world can jump to R15. And then once we're back here, then we can jump to R15, which ideally would return us back to our original caller. So let's see how this works. So we're going to save our return address in R15, which is return right here, 100A. Then we're going to jump down to print hello. We're going to print hello out. Perfect. And now we're going to save the return address for print hello, the line of code, right? We're about to save our return address here because after we jump to print world, we really want to return back to this line of code to continue execution in this particular scenario. But again, anything that calls print world, it needs to tell print world, hey, what were we doing before? So that when you're done with what you're doing, I can resume what I was doing. So if we step forward now, we're going to save our return address. It's an R15. And then we're going to jump down to print world. We're going to print that out. There's world. And then now we're going to jump back to where print hello was. You see, we did that just fine. Now we're back to return hello. But here's our problem. Register 15 no longer holds the data for where we were here. This return value, right, 100A, has long been destroyed. The right word is really clobbered. We clobber this value by accident before we needed it. And there's no way back. Nobody here remembers anything about this original function. They don't know where we were, what we did. Uh, all we know is that we wanted to return to this return hello. And that's because we only have enough slots for one memory address. We're using only one single 8-byte register. And again, even if we used all of them, it would still be a major limitation. So this is really where the stack comes in. The stack is just a sequence of bytes in memory. In this case, we have 8 bytes here, 8 bytes, 8 bytes. So you could say that they're the same as register 15, just over and over and over again. And we keep track of where we are in the stack using the stack pointer. And we're able to store a bunch of return addresses, way more than the singular one that we can store in register 15. So that's what we're going to do in the next video. We're going to look at the stack. But not only are we going to look at the stack, before we do that, we're actually going to build our own stack, a very simple construct. But I'm hoping that it really illuminates and demystifies what the stack is, because it is very simple. So we're going to build our own stack that we can then navigate and we can fill it up with return addresses and use that to have nested function calls, much like what we had here, where we can print hello and print world and keep track of all the return addresses and ultimately end up back at the start of our function. So thanks very much for joining me. I look forward to doing that and I'll see you soon.